I just want you all to know uh, for our awareness, we have a code of conduct of respecting one another and respecting the rules, uh, basic ground rules. Um, Uh, if there are any new faces here, go ahead and introduce yourself at this time. Malad says, you look different today, Destiny, so maybe you should reintroduce yourself. <laughs> Destiny says, okay, I will go ahead. I am Destiny O'Connor, and I'm the chair uh, here hosting this meeting for all of us today, and that's funny, I'm a new face. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'll allow anyone else to introduce themselves if they'd like. I see a hand. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks, I'm really, for some reason, I'm struggling to find the Zoom controls where that allow me to raise my hand, so. Um. I'm just doing oh. it manually, I guess. Yeah, it should be at the bottom. Yeah, I'm not sure why my, I'm, anyway, I'm not sure why it just looks a little different than it oh, for it's, me. I think it's now under reactions at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I think mine is all, my screen is all split between participants and chat and I don't even see my normal bar. It's probably my own, my own uh, Zoom clients issue. I'll try to find it, but anyway, uh, to the point, my name's Scott Rigby. I know I introduced myself briefly as Scott. Um, I, a, by way of quick introduction, um, I'm part of the cloud native community. I co-maintain several CNCF projects. I'm involved in some working groups, including chairing, uh, co-chairing the GitOps working group and the Open GitOps project too. And, um, and I like to, I work, I help with mentoring folks um, and I'll be speaking on that topic today, but since you asked for introductions, that's mine. And it's nice to meet you all. Stephanie says, so nice to meet you. Yes, I'll, yay. So Welcome from here. everybody. Welcome. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm not sure, Dennis, are you new here? Or do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Dennis? Dennis says, yes, I am new here. Yes, I can introduce myself. My name is Dennis. Um, should I go into any more of an explanation? Yeah, go ahead. You can feel free. My name is Dennis. This is my sign name. And I was born in Ukraine. And I have moved to Canada where I currently live now. Um, I started studying a program called Swift, but prior to that, I learned Java and left that behind, moved on to C++, left that behind. Um, I've learned many different languages, but I've focused mostly predominantly on Swift. That's my favorite programming language. Um, do you want any more information? <laughs> No, Denise says, so that's great. So nice to meet you, Dennis. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're now going to talk more about Helms triage, um, the maintenance or management plan. Would you like to take? Yes. Absolutely. Would you like to take that? Uh, on? Scott? Yes, I, yes, I would. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, everyone, um, I mentioned that I'm, I maintain several CNCF projects and one of them is Helm. So you may have heard of this project. A lot of people in the cloud and the Kubernetes community use it. Um, I've been co-maintaining Helm since 2017. And I, I'm involved in every level from governance, from, from working with the Helm charts and best practices the charts to, to being a, um, a core maintainer of the Helm project, you know, the Helm binary and um, to being on the governance committee. 
or the governance or uh, team. Uh, sorry, one quick sec. Yeah, I think I'm seeing a different screen than other people. I'm really not sure why that is, but that's okay because now that I'm speaking, I don't need to, uh, for now, I don't need to raise my hand. But um, yeah, so, so let me just get settled here. I think it was a little unsettled because my, the screen looks a little different than what I'm used to. Um, so pardon me, just bear with me for, for, for Oh, no worries. Yes, take um, your time. This is Malad. Um, if you share your screen, it makes all of our screens smaller, it, which is a little bit harder to see everyone. So just wanted to call that out. Maybe just share your screen and then uh, reduce the screen again or stop sharing so we can see one another. To Thank you. Maybe that's the best way to do it. Okay. Um, all right, great. I will go ahead and do that. Um, Destiny says, uh, it does appear differently, uh, web or browser versus the app. Some features don't show up um, or they do show up differently depending on how you're connected. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just for, well, um, yeah, I'm on the app, but, and the thing is I use Zoom all the time. I'm just not, I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's a, maybe it's just something that happened with my settings. But in any case, I'll share my screen if I can figure out how to do it. Um, or just share the link and we can look at it. Okay, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, okay, well, so <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, I'll, I'll stick in the chat. And um, for now, here is the link to the Helm project to the main um, binary where you download Helm and where you submit issues to the Helm project. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I, I co-maintain both, I co-maintain Helm, Flux, and Open GitOps, but I wanted to share with you uh, one of the ways that what we've set up for, as a contributor ladder from people who are community members to people who can participate and contribute in different ways to, um, to additional steps along the way toward potentially becoming a maintainer. And um, I give presentations to people a lot and help people walk people through the code base, giving an introduction to the code base. I don't think there's time for that today, but uh, this is more about the process of what, what that takes and, and some of the easy, some of the steps um, especially a few extra stepping stones that we've added um, to, to help make that process more achievable. And it's not as hard as some people may think. Um, the community page, or excuse me, the, the community repo for, for Helm is here. And this is, oops, sorry. is here. And uh, I just wanted to, to, to bring your attention to, to a few different parts of this. Um, one is there is, there's a, um, excuse me, um, everything that's related to the, the, the Helm organization is here. Um, the main code of conduct, um, onboarding guide for maintainers and, um, and things like that. But there's one section that a lot of people might not, under, might not know about, which is, uh, which is this uh, directory called HIPS, H-I-P-S. Um, and that stands for Helm Improvement Proposals. It was based on Python pro improvement proposals. And it's essentially a specific way of, um, of doing uh, RFCs, like maybe some other projects have RFCs, so that you can propose major changes or propose, yeah, propose major changes either in the tool itself, in processes, um, and they can also be informational. So information about the HIPs is in HIP one. Uh, you don't really need to read that right now, but just to give by way of an introduction, this is something that folks can see. And the reason that I'm bringing that up on this call. Uh, is not just arbitrary, it's 
because there is a helm improvement proposal that's been accepted and we've been using it for quite a while now that is called um that's about the title is helm triage maintainers and here it is it's hip 14. uh and this was this was a while ago now we've done we set this up two plus years ago um yeah there we go in summer of 21 and the the point of it was that there have been a lot of contributors to helm the helm project under helm helm that first link that i sent you consistently has around even when we're even when we've had a lot more people to help with pull request reviews and and so on it it would always remain somewhere around 200 to 300 open pull requests it's a highly contributed to project and some of these pull requests are new features uh bug fixes um, and other important contributions one of our problems as helm maintainers is we do not have the bandwidth to review them all. And so unfortunately, the community doesn't always get the recognition or contributors don't always get the recognition that they deserve. We try to do that. We try to, we try to have a protocol on responding to pull requests and reviewing them in a timely manner, but we're fairly few, we're a handful of people. Even though it's a major project used by so many people, um, there really aren't that many maintainers. So we identified this role called a triage maintainer. And that's for people who want to help do issue and pull request triage. Those things that I was just saying we have difficulty keeping up with. And the idea there is that is a way, I mean, you can read this proposal, but just as a short intro to this, um, it's a way for people to get a feel of whether or not they like doing that sort of this sort of maintainer work, uh, that side of maintainer work. And it's a way, to, it's kind of a combination of a mentorship where you can shadow. Essentially what, what we do is we end up having people shadow us or other people who have been reviewing these pull requests on this project for a while. And um, they can answer, they can ask any questions. You can ask any questions as you go. Um, we can help point things to, toward th two things that are perhaps not obvious, that someone who's been doing it for a while feel are obvious, but they're not obvious to someone who's approaching it new, or maybe someone who's approaching it from a different background. So that's the goal of it. And the goal is once someone's reviewing a number of pull requests and they know that they can uh, dedicate some consistent time to it, obviously not full-time, we're all working and we all have things to do, we have lives. But if we know that we can do it regularly and we enjoy doing it, then uh, one of the maintainers can nominate you as a triage maintainer. What that means is you're a real maintainer of the project. You, you are added to, you're added as a member to the Helm project. You can show that badge on your, on your GitHub profile. Um, we announce you as a triage maintainer. Um, and there are just several limitations between from or several things that being in that initial triage maintainer role, you don't get as a full maintainer. Um, and those are those are listed in this proposal. So it's it's all transparent. And there have been several people now who are full maintainers who started off as a triage maintainer. So it's a program that we know works. And Primarily, I wanted to present that. Um, and I'm also happy to, to share, we don't have such a program, or the specific type or this specific role for the Flux project um, or the Open GitOps project. Um, but we do try to do a similar thing. And I would really like to implement that in Flux. I think, uh, especially now that Flux is a graduated project, and probably though, I would, it, what would be good is to get more feedback from folks and to get more triage, more people helping with triage and having more triage maintainers in the Helm project, because this, this for Helm is kind of a pilot program. There, I don't know, there may be other projects that have this. I know there are other contributor ladders, but I don't know of other projects that have exactly this. So um, I'd like to share with all of you, if any of you are interested um, in this, 
there are ways to contribute regardless of your technical background. And there are ways to contribute and help with this. Um, and just one short example is even if someone is not really familiar with writing um, Go, the language that Helm and Kubernetes and others are, are written in, um, there are still ways that you can help with this. So for example, um, a lot of the actual triaging of, of pull requests has to do with identify, trying to understand whether or not a pull request has an issue already associated with it, one or more issues. Is it just something that someone thought about uh, and they wanted in, uh, to, to contribute to the pro project in the sense that it solves their problem? Do others have this problem? Um, then, you know, asking people that if you can't find those issues. Um, and then if there are existing issues, can you reproduce those issues? So learning how to build the, learning how to test those specific issues, making sure are there steps to reproduce them? Someone may open an issue and most, most of the time they don't give exact steps on how to, how to reproduce the problem that they're running into. Um, and sometimes their issue isn't really reproducible. It's something that happens intermittently. So that's a thing to identify too and to work with them to help them identify what, what the conditions are that make that the case. And sometimes you don't really have that luxury because someone won't respond and that's okay. So part of it is just trying to see what you can do on that side of things. The, pull the person that opens a pull request is usually more responsive because they're motivated to get their contribution into the project. So asking them for, for reproduce, uh, reproducibility steps and then going through those steps yourself and seeing if you can reproduce the problem on the versions of Helm that, that are supposed to be an issue. And if you can't, let that be known you know, and show your exact steps. If you can um, also let that be known, great, we verify that we can reproduce this issue. And then I, AI or other Helm maintainers can show you how to, or point you to the resources on how to build the Helm binary from that pull request and then use that person's contribution in that version of Helm to see if that does in fact fix the issue. And if it does, then you've done a lot of the legwork that we struggle to get to as maintainers, you know, because we, all, we also have to review the code and make sure, okay, yes, it fixes an issue that someone identified, but does it fix, in it, does it, fix it in the way that we think is the right way to do it? Does it, does it risk causing more issues, you know? Um, is it too specific? Um, it does it follow best practices, things like that. And that is part of the review once you get to the code review. But we, it's not really in anyone's interest for us to do that kind of code review unless those, until those other steps are done. And generally we have to do that ourselves. Um, and since this is all volunteer, having more people to help with that would really help the project continue to move forward. And also it's a huge part of being a maintainer. So if you, if you do that, that, and find that you enjoy doing that and can do it consistently, then I will definitely nominate you as a triage maintainer. Um, if you are able to do, have other skills and either want to learn um, Go or already have some transferable, excuse me, transferable, transferable knowledge from other projects, uh, or excuse me, other languages, um, and, uh, and or already are familiar with Go, then you could take those additional steps and give your, regardless of whether you're a full maintainer of the project, anyone can review pull requests. So you can give your opinions on things that you think feel may need to change um, or what you think works. And that's also really valuable. So, so yeah, I think mm -hmm. please, please help with that if you can. And, um, and I just wanna show you one other thing uh, on the open GitOps project because that there is a way to contribute to that too that's a little bit different because it's not code-based. Scott, I'm sorry for the interpreter. Are you saying GitOps? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, um, making sure because it's a little different than GitHub. I'm making sure I was clear, thank you. Yes, thank you, absolutely. And here is the link to that project. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, um, so, so in, 
in this project, I just want to point you to um, one file in this project, because I know that this meeting isn't all about me presenting this. Uh, I hope it's helpful to folks, but it's just one of the topics on, um, I could keep going for 12 hours on this. Uh, here is the file, it's called teams.md in that repository. And this helps to, I hope, please read this um, when you can. Um, what it shows is like why we set up teams for the Open GitOps project. Um, it's, a, it's a sandbox project in CNCF and what the process is of participating in these teams, joining a team, um, and, uh, and then a list of the people involved in, in the teams and their active status. So there are active teams, proposed teams, pause teams, and there's an, a section for inactive teams because uh, they may not be paused. Like for example, the principles committee team is over. We've We've, we have developed the 1.0 version of the GitOps principles that are accepted by every cloud uh, vendor and, and uh, player within the, the tech world who cares about GitOps. Uh, that took six months to do, um, for example, but that is now a team that, was, that succeeded and is closed. And now there are other teams that we need um, help with. So, and there may be other topics um, that someone is interested in and wants to write about, and those can become new teams. So new teams can be proposed. So this is the project for this project because it's primarily about, um, it's primarily a project around documentation, creating best practices, but there is a, a place for potentially code as well. We just don't have any in this project yet. Uh, and the code would only be for interoperability between other GitOps projects such as Argo CD, Flux, uh, Carvel, Kepton, and other GitOps projects within CNCF. Uh, and I think that's okay. really that's really all I wanted to share. So thanks very much. Please get in touch with me on Slack. I'm Scott Rigby on Slack. Okay. Uh, thanks. Wonderful. Destiny says, it's so nice to meet you, Scott. Thank you so much for that wonderful information. I just wanna make sure everything knows that what Scott's talking about is linked in the agenda. So if you want to uh, be able to follow along, all of the supporting material is there in the links in the agenda. If you have any questions, reach out to Scott or ask Scott. Yes, Malad. Malad says, yes, I can see uh, the project, um, the people who are working in the project, uh, the requirements and the asks, all of that information. I'm wondering how the process works. Is it voluntary? I guess, what is the process? Yes, it's all, vol it's all voluntary. All the, all the CNCF projects are, are voluntary and they, it has to be that way. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't get paid to do it. It just means that the CNCF or the projects themselves don't pay you to do it. Um, they do hire contractors at times. And so there are projects where folks have been hired by CNCF to work on projects, but it's very rare. It's something that are usually internal projects to CNCF. One, one example is Artifact Hub. Um, that's a project that um, Dan Cohn, um, who used to, who used to run CNCF, um, who's since passed. That was one of his projects that he started, or not, not started himself, but hired out to get help with because there was uh, a need in the community. Uh, there are many different, there were many different hubs for, there was a Helm hub, there were hubs for different types of artifacts for projects, and now there's one that consolidates them all. So that is one example, but it's, they're very rare. Mostly you, Mostly people try to get their employer to uh, approve work on the clock so that they can get paid for the work that they do. I don't know if that helped answer your question, Malad, um, or if you meant something different. Yes, that did. That was a good answer. I'm just trying to look at it from a different perspective with the process, knowing 
um, if I know GitHub is all voluntary, but I'm wondering if this is maybe different. For example, in uh, maybe in terms of giving an award to someone who does a really good job, maybe, or something they could put on their resume to show their experience, you know, to help embellish their uh, resume. Is there some type of certificate, not necessarily reward, but a certificate or something to show, um, to show, you know, for professional development purposes? I definitely, yes, but I see that Catherine has her hand raised too. So maybe, I don't know if you wanted to, to jump in before or to answer that or to jump well, in. It, it kind of goes into your, uh, into that direction, right? The way open source, as Scott mentioned, open source works, like open source is free software. And like the whole idea of it became that people contribute on their own time. Uh, of course, there are companies who pay people to, con to contribute to it, but that's like not like what we're asking for. You would have to be working for one of those companies. But the whole idea about open source is that the community contributes for free uh, and so that everyone benefits. Uh, um, there are a lot of, I mean, I think there is much more than a badge that comes uh, in terms of uh, um, what you gain from contributing, especially if you are a project maintainer, which would be like kind of like the last step of that. It is really, really well regarded. This opens a lot of, I mean, it is better than, it is a very high, uh, what it's kind of like, a, it is a title that you can call yourself. You can put that in your resume and not everyone gets that. So it is very special. And a lot of people really want to become it because it is, that's true. good and recognized. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's much more than a badge that you can put on, on LinkedIn. Like it, it is a real title, community title and very well regarded. And even if you don't are a maintainer, but if you are very active in a project, right? Uh, people, you meet people, people see you. That is also valued. You can also show like the work that you've done. So all of this and a lot of people, I mean, do it because of the benefits that you get from it professionally through the network that you build and, and the knowledge that you build that that you get through it. So it is very spe specifically in our space, right? It is very well regarded and maintainer is basically the highest level you can get. Does that make sense? Yes. Wonderful answer. Thank you. Right, Scott. Thanks. I still can't find my hand raised thing. I'll 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 work on this before the next meeting. Um, I will tell you this: no that worries. I get tons of job offers, opportunities, and so on, because I'm a maintainer project of 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 at least one project. There aren't very many people in CNCF that maintain multiple projects. I am really not sure why I do this to myself. Um, uh, I would say that I got into it for not really for professional development reasons. I got into it out of pure interest, but I also, I re I did realize pretty quickly that the open source projects that I started working on at, at the beginning of my career around 17 years ago was, um, was been it was beneficial to me almost immediately. So, so just to underscore what Catherine said, uh, there are direct professional, direct professional benefits. Um, another thing is because I'm a maintainer on projects, I have the opportunity to speak um, at cloud native event at uh, KubeCon, cloud native con on maintainer track talks. Um, every KubeCon. So really every, every CNCF project gets a, an opportunity to have a maintainer track talk um, and, a, um, and a booth at, at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon where we can help people better understand the project and just 
consequently, it increases our own visibility, but um, you can also right. get additional support from CNCF for tr um, travel scholarships. You can already, some of you may know that you can already get travel scholarships for, for being a speaker and you don't need to be a maintainer of a project to be a speaker, of course, um, but, um, but you can get specific, one of the application sections, uh, there are, there's need-based, there's, uh, uh, oh gosh, there's the diversity scholarship. And then there's also um, a, uh, a scholarship for maintainers. So, so that is also another benefit. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the major uh, benefits. I don't know. Yeah, those are, those are a few of them and, they, and they're pretty big ones. Thank you so much, says Destiny. I really appreciate that, Scott. Yeah, many, many thanks from the group. Uh, I apologize, we're gonna have to move on just for the sake of time. Um, next up, we'll be talking about- KubeCon Paris. Thank you. So, Catherine? No. Oh. Yeah, so- it's very exciting. We're going to be very, very busy. There is so much going on at KubeCon uh, for our group. Um, so the team on site uh, will be Anastasia, Milat, Rob, Martin, Emmanuel only on Wednesday. And hopefully Sandeep was working on his visa. Um, so if that, so that would be a quite good um, large group, which would be nice. Uh, there are several activities. Uh, one is we have a part-time kiosk, as you know, that's in, exactly in the project pavilion that uh, Scott mentioned. That's where all the CNCF projects are. And because we are a working group, we also got one there. And you can see the little, the exhibit hall is huge. This is just a little part and that's only open source. So that's no vendors, it's just open source. Uh, we will be there with, will be able to say hi to Scott because he will be there at the flex booth, I assume. Okay. Uh, and right. I made sure <laughs> I made sure that uh, our booth is right next to the Linkerd booth where I will be morning. So uh, the green one on the little thing is Linkerd and the red one is because uh, I was like, then I can be there and 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 help if needed or whatever. Um, so I'm really excited that it worked out. Um, okay, so we have the part-time kiosk in the morning. Uh, we have, which the idea is that anyone can come and chat with uh, our team, like any questions that they that they may have, you know, like just like most people have never interacted with a deaf or hard of hearing person. We want them to give the, get them the opportunity to come and chat, ask any questions. It's just about like creating that connection, right? Because suddenly like talking about accessibility only without knowing who is actually who actually needs it. It's just an abstract concept. Once you meet people who actually need it, then it makes it human and, and more real. So that's why I think it's really important to have that connection and, and meet as many people as possible and talk to them and recruit allies. That's what we ultimately want. We want to recruit allies, people who can, you know, like just go out there and, and, and call out when a situation is not accessible and so on. Um, so kiosk will be great. We also have during the booth crawl, a sign language crash course. So the booth crawl is at the exhibit hall uh, Wednesday night. I think there's a little bar and there are a lot of fun activities. So it's supposed to be something fun. And so we're going to have like a little um, gift. Come and join and learn a few signs. Uh, and, and just, yeah, just a fun activity. We're also going to have like an open right. space discussion. And, and uh, the links to the schedule are there. Uh, open space discussion, that's like an open a table where we're gonna have like a discussion about accessibility. Um, you can also see the link and the actual um, um, abstract uh, on the schedule. And we're gonna have quite a few speaking engagements. So uh, Milad will be uh, doing a lightning talk. It's not on the schedule yet. It's a new thing that they implemented. It's a lightning talk for projects. We had lightning talks as well. That's not on the agenda yet. Uh, Anastasia will be co-presenting with Scott at ArgoCon um, and someone else, but like they're going to be, the three of them are going to be um, um, presenting. Wow. ArgoCon is day 
before KubeCon, right? Like on day on Tuesday, where there are going to be a lot of different co-located events. Rob will be doing a talk uh, on AI with two uh, people from Google. Um, so uh, that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, then we have the diversity panel with Emmanuel, James, Rins, and other people as well. Um, then we have our tag panel uh, where Sandeep and me are going to be. And then we have Anastasia on the keynote stage on Friday. That's the highlight, absolute highlight. So that's a lot of speaking engagements. I'm really excited because it's really important to see deaf people on stage because that raises a lot of visibility, right? Like we're here, you know, like yes. people are here and a part of the community. So yeah, really excited about that. <laughs> uh, then we're working. Oops. Wow. We're working. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, this is it's a lot, amazing. Right? It is. This is the best, says Milad. Yeah, <laughs> best ever. Um, taking the stage. All right. <laughs> then we have two media interviews for written publications. Milad's just saying, this is amazing Milad. work. I just have to say, all of this work. Wow. Yeah, we're going to be busy. So Milad, no, uh, no sleeping in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to interrupt the process or I don't want to interrupt here I'm sorry you're still continuing please go on <laughs> uh, well it's so much right but yeah so <laughs> for anyone who thought they would come to KubeCon to relax forget about it okay we're gonna be busy but it's good <laughs> um, <laughs> yes yes so we have two media interviews uh, for written publications. Uh, we should have uh, the Cube interview. That's like a, like a, um, that's the one that um, Rob and Destiny did last yes, time. Yes, right. That's correct. Yeah. And so I wanted an to give you all a heads up that after your talk, expect people to come up to you and want to meet you and these last minute impromptu interviews to happen. Be prepared. Just like you said, no relaxing. We will be very, very busy running from place to place, getting interviewed over here and over there. So get ready for that experience. But it's a great time. You'll enjoy your week. Elad said, since I'll bring some tea. I'll bring lots and lots <laughs> of tea. <laughs> Yeah, because there are some parties too. So it's like, it's the party and the work, right? You have yeah, to do I, both. I prefer tea over coffee. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's uh, true. We will have time to have a party, especially with Rob. It'll be a party. <laughs> uh, okay, so those are all the activities at KubeCon. And I see Scott has a question or for you. You just had your hand raised. Uh, yes, I, don't know if you yes. Were just I, I just realized I didn't need to ask out loud, but maybe it's faster. Does everyone, do all the people in this working group who are deaf have someone to sign, a signing interpreter with them? Yes. Well, well the, the CNCF provides. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, next, uh, just because we have uh, only 15 minutes. Uh, so related to this, that's important. You see, we have like all these talks and interviews. We are working on that messaging doc, right? And um, so our working group has a very important mission. I hope you all agree. Uh, and so this document will the idea is for it to be a tool to help you communicate that effectively, right? Because uh, you all have kind of, you know what it is and so on, but it's like, what does effectively mean, right? It's like really describing our mission and goals, articulate why it is important and how they can help. Like, remember, we want to recruit allies. So the how they can help is important. Then educate people on what deaf and hard of hearing people bring to the table. And we really have to do that in a clear and concise way so people remember right like because if you have a lot of ideas and your thoughts are not organized you're going to confuse people uh, right so it's really important to be you know kind of understand that or like find a way to to express it in a way that people can remember 
and 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 then like like the key the key points as well. So that's kind of the goal of the messaging doc. And so basically, how do you use it? Don't cover it all. Like you will see, it's very long. So it's not you're not you're gonna overwhelm people if you tell everything that is on that document. But instead, you pick a few points. You know that that you that resonate with you with your experience and then you focus on that right and then um and uh also if you have a speaking opportunity and 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 you see something really resonates with the audience let us know right let's let the team know it's like oh when i said this because that's really important too because we want to know we need to know what what resonates with people most right um so the link is there please do do go look at it we have a few gaps uh, any questions regarding the messaging doc? Okay, so everyone knows. No, um, no so ideally, it would, would be great to have that done by Friday, if possible. Most of the most of it is already there, so it's not it's not a huge. I mean, we it's not a lot of work. I think we just need to fine tune it and maybe find a few more examples. Uh, and then related to that, whenever we have advocacy speaking opportunities, right? I mean, of course we wanna talk about, when I have you talk, participate in tech, tech talks where uh, like that is not really a, a tech, but whenever we talk about our work, it is really like every opportunity is really an opportunity to raise awareness and recruit allies, right? So. When you prepare a talk, first think about who's the audience, right? Uh, and what information can you give them that will empower them, right? To push for a more accessible world, right? So the desired outcome is, right, we should do A, B, C, right? Like they should say like, oh, this is a great idea. We should do this at our company. The undesired uh, <laughs> outcome is like, oh yeah, that sucks. But there's nothing I can do about it, right? Like, like tell them something that is not ideal. But if they don't have, it's not something that they can do or change. It's interesting information, but it's not really empowering them to do to help bring change. That's why I think thinking about who you're talking to and what kind of information you're providing is really important, right? Because it's like you need you want to empower them, and then uh, really pick your main takeaways right like again as with the messaging um doc right you if you push a, put a lot of information um on that they're not they're going to be overwhelmed they're not going to remember everything right so people can only remember so much so really right decide what are your key takeaways and try to like make sure that comes across clearly right and then always end with a call to action Right. Again, this is an, our opportunity to uh, recruit allies. Like sometimes you go to a talk and say, oh, this is great. But then you go and you forget about it. Like ask something about them. Right. Like what can they do to help our cause? Give them something actionable. And sometimes there's not something. Uh, it can be something really concrete, but sometimes there is nothing that concrete. So if you cannot find something mm -hmm. that concrete, it's like just be aware, uh, like, these are the issues. Be aware. Call out if there is a, something is inaccessible. You know, if you see a, an event and they're not doing ABC, tell them. Right, like just having people who kind of understand why it's important out there working, uh, like like walking out in the world. You know, because there are so many more hearing people, of course. Right, so if they can go and spread the word and and just point out things that are inaccessible, that's a huge win. Right, so I just and that's and like the. A lot of that is in the messaging doc as well, but yeah, the point is basically when you're preparing those talks, really see this. It's not just like a great opportunity. It's like it is a chance to 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 really raise awareness and 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 recruit allies. So let's try to be strategic uh, and and make sure that we we think about those things. Who's the audience? What should should they take away? And what are we asking from? I think those are kind of key building blocks. Any questions? Okay. Deep says this then, is great. Destiny says you covered everything perfectly. Yeah, and that's 
why the messaging deck, uh, the messaging doc is important too, right? Because that's kind of what the idea is. It helps you formulate those things, right? And and um, it's a tool to help to like, yeah, kind of achieve those goals. Uh, and then uh, just a quick reminder for everyone, please ask your favorite interpreter to, to sign up for the interpreter database. The link is in the doc. Um, because okay. I don't think I've seen from everyone. So that's all I had. Destiny says, uh, any questions? We have just a few minutes left. Any concerns? Any Anything to share from the group? Milad says, I do have something, but I can wait. And if no one else has any questions, I'll go ahead and ask. I don't want to be the only one taking the floor here. I want to open it up for anyone else first. You can go ahead, says Destiny. Okay. So um, with Zoom, the chat uh, will disappear once we close out this meeting. And there's a lot of great information and links that are in the chat. How can we make sure we save those? Destiny says it's all within the agenda. Everything can be found there. Um, whatever links, put it onto the agenda um, or it's already there. So if you have any questions as well, you can reach out to Scott about Helm. If you have any questions about KubeCon or anything that we just discussed today, it can all be found there in the agenda. All of the links have been saved there. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, Milad says, any others with any other questions? Uh, Jay, no, you can go ahead. All right, um, regarding the booth for people uh, when they come to interact. I'm wondering if there can be some kind of recording done or video uh, for people to watch on YouTube, maybe uh, signing some simple signs. If we could upload a video such as that, signing different specific signs, is that allowed or no? I just wanted to put that idea out there. Destiny says, Catherine, do you have... I see your hands up. Yeah, so there is a monitor. And I actually forgot to mention that like we should like have a laptop. Um, so I may have sometimes mine, but like there's a monitor. Uh I will I think I should have like an like an adapter to put to plug in the monitor, uh the laptop in the monitor. And we can uh put stuff on there. Not with um yeah, so um I was thinking to have like a little slide or something, come chat with us or, you know, like some stuff that we can have. We can also have a, a video uh, that you, you know, like, yeah, whatever you think uh, would make sense. Um, Destiny says, I have an idea. I Oh, I think what he's meaning is uh, to videotape our interactions uh, with people from the booths. Is that allowed to have a video made from the interactions at the booth and then have that turned into a YouTube video to give people a snapshot of what went on at KubeCon. He, so we want to know, are we allowed to video tape our interactions with just yes. regular people passing by? Is that what you were asking, Milan? Yes, that's right. Um, I just want to share my experience and give you another perspective through all of my travels, traveling the world, presenting and interacting with deaf and hearing audiences. A lot of hearing people specifically are very interested uh, in sign language. Sometimes it's their first time seeing sign language. So I video, capturing a video of that and having that recording so that people can see signing and just that whole process, seeing the interaction between deaf and hearing people, it just helps to raise awareness um, and spread that knowledge quickly. Um, I've just seen personally how much these social interactions when recorded and put out on the internet can just how far, how viral they can go. So maybe we can designate a specific 
Uh, or we can ask the person before we film them, or maybe if they're wanting to learn, say one word or specific terminology or a phrase, like have a nice day in sign language, we can teach them that short phrase, just it'll only take a minute, of course, depending on their, their signing knowledge or fluency already, we can film that and then they can go home and share it however they like with anyone. Um, I think that'll just help spread the knowledge, spread awareness. Destiny says, yeah, Deb, so, did you have something to share? Yeah, so I think, like, so basically I was going to say, um, people do that all the time. Like, a lot of people go there and do their little own videos and, and put them on social media. So you can definitely do that, uh, or we can definitely do that, right? Uh, people also do their own little interviews, you know, like maybe... Uh, I don't know if that's something you would be interested in, Milad, but, you know, like, just go with uh, one of the interpreters and ask people, like, hey, did you know that deaf people, like, what do you think, you know, like, do little interactions, just go and talk to people, pe you know, and, and ask them, what do you think about all these new changes? I don't know, like, it could be a mix of showing people uh, how they learn to sign and also just asking people questions, you know, that would be awesome. And uh, that's a video that we can put on YouTube and the CNCF would definitely, um, um you know share again and and uh so yeah i think that sounds like a fun thing that would raise awareness and shows again deaf people at the conference right That's and i think right. we have one minute to go um also i wanted to let uh milad let you know that yeah you can video even some people filmed me and they sent me the video uh, you know, in my inbox and they say, oh, I saw your video. I really enjoyed your presentation. So just know that even without people's awareness, there's people videotaping each other all the time um, and you'll see things online. So yes, just know that that's an expectation and that's normal. Um, nothing to worry about. And I really want to um, be able to show that um, some people who are hearing and don't have any knowledge of sign language or whatever, that um, that they can just be exposed to sign language and have that sort of support while they're trying to learn a little something. You know, I mean, people think, oh, it takes a long time to learn sign language, but you can learn a little bit in a minute. So you don't have to learn everything all at once. You can just learn something, you know, and then they can go home and grow their knowledge about sign language or uh, or the culture should they care to do so. Yeah, I think the interpreters have to take off. So um, anyway, thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate you for being here and um, nice to meet Scott and Dennis. Really nice to see you.